You're listening to the Denver Real Estate Investing Podcast, where it's all about helping you grow your Denver real estate portfolio. Here's your host, Chris Lopez. When it comes to analyzing rental properties, cash flow is not everything. Now, I realize that might be a shocking statement to say when it comes to analyzing rental properties, but it's the truth. There is more to investing in real estate and there's more to analyzing rental properties than just the amount of cash flow you're getting from a, a rental property. Now, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it's not the most important and the only thing to focus on because if you're not looking at other the other ways you make money in real estate, you're missing on some very important pieces of the puzzle when it comes to using real estate to create wealth and fund your retirement one day. So my name is Chris Lopez, and I'll be going through a very uh, detailed episode today on a different way you can go out there and start analyzing rental properties using the four ways you make money in real estate. And this is the first course, or I should say the first module in the property analysis course that I'm putting together. So make sure you understand this episode before you go on to the other episodes in this course because this will build upon it. And as a quick reminder, you got three ways to learn about this information. Obviously, you got this podcast you're listening to right now. You can also watch the video on YouTube and actually go also go to the website and go to the blog post for to see more detailed graphs, numbers, and examples. Because I know how it is. A lot of times you listen to a podcast, something sounds great, but you're driving, you're multitasking, and then you want to go in and get more specifics. So if you if you hear something and want to get more details, make sure you check the show notes and go to the uh, blog to get that specific item that you want. If you get confused, you got questions, always reach out to me. So I want to ask you, if I asked you, what is your return on investment? What is your ROI? What would your answer be to me? And think about this for a second. If I say, what is your ROI? What type of return on investment do you want in real estate? What is going to be your answer? And I get different responses from everyone I, I ask, obviously, because everyone has their own requirements. And it, it dramatically varies from a newer investor to someone who's a veteran investor. Because for newer investors, I often get, I'll often ask the question, hey, what is your ROI? And they'll say, oh, well, I want a, a property with a good return. Can, can you help me find one? And my response is, well, I mean, maybe what is good? And you can't see my air quotes here, but what is, what is a good return to you? You know, a good return, they say. And I reply, no, I don't know what a good return is to you. Like, can you quantify it? Like, give me a number. What are you looking for? Because good is subjective. And a lot of times they'll say, um, you know, something like 7%. I just want to be the stock market. Well, 7% of what? What return on a metric are you using? Or are you simply just trying to get 7% return on your money? Now, if you don't have a good answer, don't be embarrassed. This is how every investor, myself included, initially started as we're figuring out how to analyze properties, how to measure the returns and see if it's the right return that we're looking for in our overall portfolio. Because when you have money, it's not just about money you can invest in real estate. You can also invest in the stock market. You can invest it in a business. You can invest in something else. So it's a good idea to learn how to measure the return so you can make sure it's the best use of your capital. Now, if someone says, I just want a 7% return on my money, I just want to be the stock market. In my mind, that's very, very simple to do. Even in today's current Denver market, I can blindfold myself, go to RE Colorado, throw a dart and hit a property and probably beat that 7% return, which might sound really odd, but I will explain that as we go through this episode so you can understand why I say that. So first off, there are two things or two parts to understanding your ROI when it comes to real estate investing. Actually, there's really two things to ROI when it comes to any investment, but we'll talk about it in terms of real estate. So the first part is you have to define and understand the returns and said that is plural, not singular, the returns that real estate provides and then define and understand what your true total initial investment is when you go out there and buy a property. So let's start off with the first part, which are the ways you make money in real estate. And in real estate, there are four ways you make money. And this is in no particular order. 
appreciation, cash flow, debt pay down, and then depreciation, which is your tax benefits. So we'll dive into all these details as we progress through this module, because I know a lot of times people just focus on cash flow and sometimes mention appreciation, but we never really talk about debt pay down and tax benefits. Well, let's talk about that. Let's peel back the curtain. Let's define those and actually figure out a way to quantify that so you can see what type of return you're getting from those different ways you can make money in real estate. So four ways, appreciation, cash flow, debt pay down, and tax benefits. The second step is defining your true and total initial investment. So let's just uh, imagine that you're going out there and buying a $400,000 rental property and you need to put down a 25% down payment. So that's going to require $100,000 for the down payment. Now, if you go out there and buy the property, are you only writing a check or wiring over $100,000? No, you're not. Because there's a lot of other costs associated with buying a property. Now, if you take that same $100,000 and go to your Fidelity account or your Schwab account or your Vanguard account and use it to go buy a S&P 500 index fund or an ETF or even a specific you know, stock, let's say you want to go out there and buy Amazon stock or whatever stock, a lot of times the transaction cost on buying a stock or index fund is zero to five or ten dollars. I actually can't think in the last 10 years when I've actually spent any money to go out there and buy stocks uh, because those transaction costs have become so minimal now with all the online trading. And plus, because I buy uh, stock market index funds, which usually have no cost associated with them. But even if there's a $10 cost, well, that is a very insignificant transaction cost. If I'm investing $100,000, do I really care about a $5 fee? Personally, I don't, and I have not met anyone that would care about $5 when they're spending $100,000. But if you're buying a property that requires a $100,000 down payment, you got way more than $5 in cost to go out there and buy the property. And so there are, in addition to the down payment, there are three main categories for the real estate transaction cost. So the first one is acquisition cost. These are things like your home inspection, your appraisal, prepaying your property insurance premium for the year, transfer taxes, title insurance, recording fees, closing fees, plus a bunch of other fees that pop up on the closing statement when you buy real estate. The second thing you have is loan cost. And loan costs are just, what does it take to go out there and get a loan to finance the property? Now, if you're buying the property all cash, yes, you will have you know no loan cost or minimal loan cost. But in reality, very, very few people are buying rental properties all cash. And I would be willing to bet the majority of people listening to this episode are all using financing to go out there and buy their property. So there is a cost to go out there and get the loan. And it could be minimal from just paying the underwriting and transaction fee to an extra couple thousand dollars if you're buying points down to reduce your interest rate. So that's the second one. So the third one is your rent ready cost. And rent-ready costs are any initial repairs you need to make it rentable or to get the desired rental income, cost to place a tenant, and carrying costs if the property's going to be be vacant for an extended period of time. So if you think about this, the total initial investment when it comes to buying a piece of real estate is going to be your down payment, your acquisition cost, your loan cost, and your rent-ready cost. So that is way more than just that $100,000. So for example, a lot of times uh, those costs outside the down payment, the acquisition, the loan, and the rent-ready costs can range from anywhere from about $2,000 on the low side to about $15,000 on the higher side if you're buying multifamily and or buying some points down on your interest rate. So two to $15,000, well, now we're getting into some significant transaction costs uh, when buying rental property. And I believe those costs should be associated or should be calculated in your initial investment. And therefore, you need to account for that when you look at the return on that property. Because that $100,000 by real estate, you need more than $100,000 than if you go buy $100,000 worth of stocks. Because you go buy $100,000 plus another $10,000 in transaction costs, you're really investing $110,000. So in my mind, we should compare $110,000 in the stock market, the bond market, or whatever else you're buying. 
So uh, I know I get this question all the time. They say, oh, well, what is the rule of thumb or what's the fixed amount or what's the percentage I can use for calculating those transaction costs? There really is no percent or fixed price or fixed percent you can use. Uh, so just, you know, as you get into specific properties, make sure you talk to your agent, whether it's me or you're using someone else and talk to your lender to get those costs. My main point here, I don't want to get too focused on the details. My main point here is for you to realize that there's more money that you have to use than other just your down payment to go out there and buy rental properties. All right, so we got the returns figured out and we now have defined what our total initial investment is. So those are the two important aspects on calculating your complete return on investment. Now, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see this. You may, if you've been to a class or used our most recent version of the rental property spreadsheet that Joe Massey put out, but right now I'm looking at the return on investment quadrant. And this is a great visual guide that shows you the four ways you can make money in real estate in a visual manner and actually gives you the output of the return in both a percent format and a dollar format. So you got appreciation. So if you think of a quadrant, to define it, a quadrant is just going to, if you imagine taking a, a piece of paper and taking a pencil, draw a vertical line and then draw a horizontal line. So you have a cross or a T on there and now you have four quadrants. So in the upper left quadrant, you have appreciation. In the upper right quadrant, you have cash flow. In the lower right quadrant, you have tax benefits. And the lower left quadrant, you have debt pay down. So if you want to see this, make sure you go to the website, check the show notes to go click on it. Now, I wish I could take credit for creating this because I think it is one of the coolest things I've seen in real estate the last year or two, but I can't. Uh, this is actually a brainchild of James Orr, who is an investor and real estate broker in Fort Collins. And he's actually got it registered through his, as a trademark through his company called the Real Estate Financial Planner LLC. So I just want to give a big thank you to James because he's been gracious enough for not only creating it, but gracious enough to allow me to use it uh, in my content and also put it in the spreadsheet with uh, Joe Massey's uh, rental property spreadsheet analyzer. So if you see James, make sure you tell him thank you for allowing us to use his cash flow quadrant, not cash flow quadrant, the return on investment quadrant, because it's a really, really powerful uh, visual guide. All right. So now what I'm going to do is actually dive into each one of those quadrants or each one of the four ways you make money in real estate and talk about each section in a little bit more detail. So the first one we'll talk about is appreciation. And simply put, appreciation is how much the property value increases over time. Now, I recall when I was first getting into real estate investing years ago and I was spending a lot of time on Google and reading different websites, a very common thing I saw on forums and websites out there was just buy for cash flow. Don't worry about appreciation. You may or may not get some, but if you do, it's a cherry on top. And that's what I look for initially. I said, great, I'm not going to worry about appreciation. Well, if you don't, it really has a big impact on the numbers. And now I don't agree with that statement or that sentiment of thought. I think it's too simplistic uh, and they are not using any historical data. So if you look at the data of the last, I think it's the last 42, the last 46 years in Denver, the last 42 years, prices have been more expensive than the previous year. So 42, the last 46 year, prices have been more expensive than the previous year. Well, that's appreciation. And then looking at some other data, if you use the Case-Shiller Index, uh, they've measured that appreciation or that real estate on a nationwide level over a 100-year-plus time frame has appreciated at just over 3% a year. Now, that's a 100-plus year time frame nationwide, not market-specific, and it's been uh, in the low 3%. Let's just call it 3% for easy math. But what else is 3%? It's The inflation rate's 3%. So, great. We can. Uh, should we not think that, should we not expect real estate to keep pace with inflation? I, for one, think it should. Uh, if my asset does not keep pace with inflation, that worries me. I don't want an asset that does not keep pace with inflation for the next 30 years. So going down from the national level to Denver, uh, if you look at Denver last 45 years, and this is from 1974 to 2018, homes have appreciated at a 6.5% annual rate and condos at a 5.5% annual rate. 
And that has not been crazily skewed by the last couple of years of amazing appreciation we've had. But that's been the last 40 years through uh, growth phases, uh, some plateau phases, and the big crash we had you know, 10, 12 years ago when prices dropped. So with those data points in mind, is it wise to not model or not assume appreciation? I don't think it is. I think we've seen appreciation for a long time. We've seen appreciation in Denver. And what's going on with Denver? Denver's a growing city. The two main things that drive growth and appreciation are people moving here and then jobs and businesses moving here. And we have both of those factors happening in Denver. We have more people and more jobs and businesses moving here. We're not a shrinking market. If we were a shrinking market, like some markets in the Midwest or other parts of the country, yeah, we might not expect to see appreciation. But look at historical data and just using some common sense, big picture factors at Denver Metro. I'm not yet meet anyone that does not think Denver prices will be higher in 20 or 10, 20, 30 years than they are now. So I'm going to use appreciation of my factors. That's what I do with all my modeling. Now, the million dollar question is, what appreciation rate should I use for modeling my investment here in Denver? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but where I fall and the majority of investors fall that I talk with, they use somewhere between three to five percent. You know, very few people, actually no one I've met expects us to continue in an eight, nine, ten percent appreciation rate. And very few people expect us to be lower than a 3% or inflation rate over the long run. Now, we might have a couple of years where it drops below 3%. And I'm talking about the averages for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So ask yourself this right now. Do you think Denver prices will be lower a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now? The answer is probably no. So I personally use somewhere between 3 and 5%. And I don't always stick to one. It kind of just depends on my mood for the day. If I'm running it really conservative, conservative, I'll be 3%. If I'm more optimistic, I'll be 5%. So I typically use 3 or 4%, uh, but I bounce around between those numbers myself. So if you've got questions on this or on the beta, reach out to me. So the next quadrant is the cash flow quadrant. Or the other way you make money in real estate is the cash flow return. So out of all the returns, this is the metric or this is the way people are most familiar with is cash flow. So I'll keep this section really brief. Cash flow is simply your rent minus all your expenses for running the property minus your mortgage payments. Now, I separate out expenses, which we call operating expenses and your mortgage payments because those are two different things. So your expenses are your operating expenses that you have to pay to keep the property running. Insurance, taxes, property management if you use it, repairs and maintenance, capital expenditures, common utilities, landscaping, uh, snow removal, all that stuff you have to use to maintain the property, bring in rental income. And your mortgage payments are, you know, what your monthly payment is to pay off your loan. Now, some people may pay the property cash. Some people may have that property paid off after 10, 20, or 30 years. So that's why we separate them out. So a very simplistic example, and this is just some rough numbers from properties we see in Denver. If you have a property that rents for about $1,800 in rent, you subtract out $500 for operating expenses, so property management, HOA, taxes, insurance, all the other stuff, and then $750 in your monthly mortgage payment, you're left with $550 a month in cash flow before taxes. All right, so getting into the other two quadrants, these are the ones that no one ever really talks about real estate. And if they do, they mention it, but they actually never go actually go into numbers in here. So I'm gonna give you a very high level overview of debt pay down and depreciation. Now keep in mind, I'm not a CPA. I'm also not a lender. So I'm giving you a minor standing of this and my, you know, simplistic version of how these returns work. So if you want to understand these fully, make sure you talk to a licensed professional like a CPA or a lender uh, because I'm a real estate agent and I'm not licensed to give you specific advice on this. So debt pay down, obviously you only get if you finance your rental property, but I mean, more than nine out of 10 clients I work with use financing. I'm trying to think of anyone that's bought cash. I mean, probably 98 out of 100 are using finance or uh, yeah, lending or finance to go out there and uh, get rental properties. So if you buy cash, you don't get this. 
or once your loan is paid off, your debt pay down goes away. So on the website, I've got an amortization table that shows your monthly payment, that shows the amount of your payment towards principal and the amount of payment towards your interest. And I'm just showing the first six years. And to keep things simple and consistent, I'm still using that $400,000 rental property uh, that I mentioned a few minutes ago. I'm assuming it's a $400,000 rental property at a 4% mortgage over 30 years. So it's a 30-year fixed mortgage. I can't remember if I put 20% down or 25% down in the payments. So if you check it, you know what, it's going to be one or the other, you'll get the concept on here. So taking that mortgage over 30 years, your payment is $1,909.66. And that's how the payment is every year for the life of the loan until the very last month, and then it goes away. So for the next 29 years, 11 months, you're paying $1,909.66 a month. So in the first payment, $576 goes towards principal, and then $1,333 goes towards interest. In month two, your second payment, your principal, your payment towards principal goes from 576 to 578, and your interest drops by two bucks to $1,331. So I'm not going to read every line of amortization table off to you because that would be boring. Uh, but I just want to drive on the point and make you realize that every single time you're paying that payment, assuming you're using a amort- a loan that's not just interest, but a principal interest loan, which is how most people buy rental properties, every single month, two things are happening. You're actually buying principal back in your property, which is increases equity. And then you have more money every month going towards your principal. So the key point here is that Every single month, as you make your payments, you're getting a return on that money because you have more equity building in your property. And guess what? If this is a rental property, who's paying that loan for you? Is it you or is it your tenant? It's your tenant. It's other people's money. So you're getting a return because every single month, you're getting more equity in your property and equity is money that you can use later to go out there and buy more properties or refinance or do something with it. So there's a lot more details to this understanding, like the percent returns and all that, which I'm not going to go into quite yet. I'll discuss some actual uh, specific examples later on this episode. I just want you to understand conceptually that every time you make you make your monthly loan payment, you're getting that return because you're buying equity, or I should say your tenants are buying you more equity in your property. So the last quadrant or the last way you go out there and make money in real estate from returns perspective is the tax benefits, uh, which are known as depreciation. I'm going to say bounce back and forth between tax benefits and depreciation because depreciation and appreciation often get commingled. So depreciation, not commingled, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I uh, you know merge the two or they sound too similar, I should say. Appreciation is where the property goes up in value. Depreciation with a D as in dog is the tax benefits that you get from owning property. So depreciation benefits are based on federal tax law. So you get these benefits for investment properties, but not your primary residence. Now, if you're house hacking it, that's something else you want to make sure you talk with your CPA with. But generally speaking, these are income properties where you get depreciation. And these can generate a significant tax savings, which indirectly puts money back into your pocket. So when you're buying any type of real estate, you're actually buying two things. You're buying the land and the structure. And the structure is officially called improvements. So the government looks at it two ways. It says, great, you're buying land and you're buying improvements. They say your land does not depreciate because it's land. It's going to be there forever. But your improvement does depreciate. So this is the same same concept if you own a business When you buy a computer or you buy a car or you buy a truck or you buy office furniture, they give you, you know, a five year or seven year table to depreciate those, uh, those assets because they say, Hey, you have wear and tear. They have a useful life. So therefore, after so many years, you need to go out there and buy a new one. So these are tax benefits you get just like you would if you're running a business, but this is for real estate investing. And you don't get this in the stock market. You don't get this in the bond market. This is one of those things that makes real estate really, really attractive. So how do you calculate uh, depreciation? 
And I have to put another disclaimer in here. Make sure you talk to your CPA, of course. Uh, but a very simplistic way to do it and the way I figure it out before I talk to my CPA or just let my CPA figure out at the end of the year is you can actually go to the assessor's office, office, go to the assessor's website <laughs> because all the data is on there, I should say. Uh, and they'll actually show you how they categorize the land value and the improvement value because they'll say you're paying this percent of taxes on your land and this percent of taxes on your improvement value. So I'm going to use an example here of the last fourplex I bought. This is a fourplex in Westminster I purchased, and I went to the Adam County's assessor's website, and they said my land assessed value is $4,970, and my improvements assessed value are $30,070. So for a total assessed value of about $35,000. So does that mean I paid $35,000 for the fourplex? No, I wish it was. I paid $850,000 for it. But once they run it through their calculation to calculate their value to then figure out what taxes you owe on there, that's their uh, assessed value. But here's how you can figure out how much the tax benefits you get or at least estimate it. Because that $4,900 towards the land is about 14% of the overall total assessed value. And the improvements or the structure assessed value is about 86%. So a very simplistic thing is you can say, great. So if the county assessor says 86% of this property is towards the improvements, then I can depreciate 86% of my property. Now, depending on what part of Denver metro you're in, actually, or depending on what part of the country you're in, they're going to be all different types of rates as far as, you know, how much more the land is valued. If you're in a hot part of town, like the Highlands, you're going to see a higher land value and a lower improvement value because location, 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 that land is worth a lot more. So make sure you see, you know, you look this up and you get a feel for it because it can change dramatically depending on what part of town you're in. So I've got that 86% figure from the uh, website. So I can say $86,000 times my purchase price of $850,000 for a estimated improvement of $731,000. I should say the total estimated improvement of the purchase was $731,000. So great, I've got that 731 figure and the government says with real estate, you can depreciate it over 27.5 years. That's for residential real estate. Commercial is a different figure. But since most of us are focused on residential, just keep 27.5 years in mind. And why they choose 27.5 years in mind, I have no clue. So don't ask me. Go down a Google rabbit hole if you want to know, but that's government. (laughs) So you take that 731, that $731,000 divided by 27.5 years, and that gives me about a $26,500 annual tax benefit. And the government says every year that you own this, you can write off or depreciate $26,500 over the next 27.5 years. So that is the gross tax deduction that the property spits off. Now, the benefit that you get or that I get, since this is my example property, it ultimately depends on your tax bracket because the tax bracket will determine how much your benefit is on there. So here's a very simplistic example of some rounded numbers. So if I'm in a 25% tax bracket and I own this property, 25% of 26,500 will give me a tax deduction of about $6,645 of a total benefit I get. And the investor A or the other investor, if they're at a 50% tax bracket, 50% times 26,500 is $13,300. So the higher tax bracket means generally the higher the benefit you get from a depreciation. And so keep in mind that gross benefit you get at $26,000 does not mean that's not the amount of taxes you're paying. That's that last figure of $6,645 in my example. That means I'm getting that money refunded to me on my taxes. Now, does government write me a check exactly for $6,645? No, they don't. But that gets calculated into my overall tax liability at the end of the year. So it might mean I owe less money or I might get a bigger refund or it offsets other thing. It's one of those left pocket, right pocket type things where you're getting the benefit of it, but you just usually don't see it directly. 
Now, of course, this is a very simplistic example, and there's other a lot of other factors that comes into calculating taxes and all this stuff. So that's why you want to make sure you talk to your CPA. Uh, but I wanted to give you that high level gist of it so you could understand it. Now, if you got lost in some of the ways I calculated it or the figures of it, don't sweat it. I just wanted to walk you through the example. So as we go through specific examples, numbers down the road, you can kind of understand where it came from. And of course, if you want to see these numbers in detail, make sure you go to the website and you can see all those uh, numbers written there on the website. Okay, so we just went into some details about those four types of returns and, and how they are derived. So I want to spend a few minutes on talking about some other aspects of these returns. Now, I am looking at the visual return on investment quadrant. So you may or may not be looking at this, but the top half of the quadrant is what we call speculative and uncertain. And that is appreciation and cash flow. Those are the top two on the quadrant. Appreciation is top left, cash flow is top right. They are speculative. Now, you might be saying, yeah, I agree with that on appreciation, but cash flow is speculative too? Yeah, it is. Now, while we have no control of appreciation, we can do our best guess to model it. We can't guarantee it. And for cash flow, what cash flow are you guaranteed? You're guaranteed the last rent check that you deposited yesterday, a week ago, a month ago, because until you get the next month's rent check, you know, your cash flow is uncertain. It is speculative. Now we can do a much better job of estimating cash flow, but depending on the tenants, they may not pay for a couple months, then you're evicting them for months. If the market goes crazy, you know, not only are we losing appreciation, but we may be losing some cash flow as well. So my point here is that. Everyone says appreciation, don't count on it. I agree, don't count on it, but do your best job to model it. But realize too that cash flow is not a guaranteed return because it's only as good as your last rent check from your tenant. Now going to the bottom side of the quadrant where we have debt pay down and tax benefits, these are more fixed and more certain returns. And I hesitate to use the word guaranteed, but they're pretty damn near guaranteed. Because as the old saying goes, there's only two guaranteed things in life, death and taxes. But getting a return on debt paid out and tax benefits are pretty damn near guaranteed in my mind. Because no matter what happens on the market conditions, you get these benefits. As long as, I should say, as long as you're paying your monthly mortgage payment, you're getting a debt pay down. As long as you own the property within those 27.5 years, you're getting those tax benefits. Now, if you stop paying your mortgage, you don't have the debt pay down return, but you got a lot bigger problems on your hand because you're not paying your debt. But assuming you're paying your monthly mortgage and you are filing your taxes correctly, you're getting these two returns. So these are much, much more certain uh, because they don't depend on what the market is doing right this instance. Because even if property values skyrocket or property values drop or you have tenants leave or all these other things happen, these two benefits... They stay about the same. It does not matter what happens in the future because they're based off of the time when you purchased the property, what your debt was, and that's also how they figure out the depreciation was what your purchase price was when you bought the property. Okay, so that was top side and bottom side. Just want to drill home that uh, cash flow and appreciation are, are uncertain. Your debt pay down tax benefits are pretty damn near certain. Okay, another way to look at this quadrant and the returns you get in real estate is what we call the cash now side. This is the right side of the quadrant where you have cash flow and tax benefits because this is cash you realize right now. So cash flow, we generally think of on a monthly basis. Great, I get my rent check, I pay my bills, I pay my mortgage payment, I'm left over with $500 a month. Great, that's my cash flow. Now your tax benefits, you don't get that monthly benefit, but you do realize it when you file your taxes. Like I said earlier, depending on how it uh, intermingles with all your other taxes and tax liability, other stuff you have going on, you'll realize that gain one way or the other. So that's cash now. The left side of the quadrant, which is appreciation and debt pay down, this is your cash later side. This is your equity side. Because what happens as your property appreciates? That's equity. What happens when you pay down your debt? You're building equity. So I like to think of equity as my real estate piggy bank. And it's something we really can't tap into on a monthly or yearly basis continually. But as your equity builds, you do have options down the road to tap in the equity 
to go use equity to go pursue other investments, whether it's rental property or other assets. And so you really have three main ways of tapping into the equity. You can sell the property. You can get a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit, or you can do a cash out refinance in your property. Those are the three main ways you can extract equity out of the property and then use that money for later. Now, here's the thing. If you buy a property today, you're not getting a HELOC or uh, doing a cash out refinance a month from now because you don't have enough equity unless you put down 80% or some very high dollar amount. But most people are putting down 5% for a house act property or 20 to 25% for investment property. You're not tapping equity for a while because you have to pay down your debt and the market has to appreciate to give you enough equity so you can tap into it to make it worth selling or to make it worthwhile for a lender to give you cash out of your property. So we'll talk a lot more about this in the rest of the course. So if you want to learn more about that, make sure you listen to the to a later episode on return on equity because we talk about different ways to extract it and what type of returns you can expect from that. All right. So if you take all four of those returns, that gives you the complete return on investment. So when I buy a property, I get appreciation, I get cash flow, I get debt pay down, and I get tax benefits. So rather than saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we might get appreciation, we might get debt pay down, we might get tax benefits, but we know we're getting this cash flow, don't you think it's prudent and gives you a more realistic reality check to go out there and look at all four returns and do your best to quantify it through projection than just looking at cash flow and saying, oh, yeah, I get returns of the other three things. No, let's quantify all four returns so we can see what we're getting from the property and also compare it to other opportunities you have out there. So if you add all four of those together, you will get your complete return on investment when looking at real estate. So I'm about to shift gears. We went from conceptual talking points now to a couple examples on what we're moving towards. And I'll walk you through a few examples on here of using uh, this cat, the return on investment quadrant to look at these four ways you make money in real estate. So I'll do my best to go over the numbers, but if you want the specific details, check out the YouTube video or go to the blog post to see everything. So the first one we'll look at is a three-bedroom, two-bathroom Aurora rental property. And this is a condo. And if you listen to future podcast episodes, we've talked about this, you know, a couple dozen times on properties we buy. Generally speaking, these are about the best cash flowing properties we've been seeing in Denver the last couple of years. So this specific property we bought in early uh, early 2019 for about $190,000. And it's a three-bedroom, two-bathroom condo. Now I'm looking at a couple of screenshots I took from Joe Massey's uh, rental property spreadsheet. So this property required a 25% down payment, which was $47,500, which is part of your overall initial investment. But remember, we also have three other parts to initial investment. We have acquisition cost. This is about $2,500 in acquisition cost. Loan cost for about uh, $1,550. And the Total initial repair costs were about $1,000. I think this place needed new paint or carpet or something like that, just very small stuff. But remember, your total investment are all four of those added up. Your down payment, your acquisition cost, your loan cost, and your initial repair costs. So our total all-in initial investment to get this property rented is $52,540. Now, is that exact to the penny? No, it's not because I rounded the acquisition cost. I rounded the initial repair cost. And this property was not tenant occupied. So it doesn't take into account the 16 days of vacancy to get a tenant in there and the 16 days of carrying cost. But those are dollars and it's not worth getting tripped over a couple dollars as long as we can get in the ballpark within a couple thousand dollars so you can understand the concept. So keep in mind, we've got 52,500 in total initial investment. The investor put this on a 30 year mortgage and his interest rate was 4.875%. So I'm plugging in all of our typical expenses here and assumptions. So vacancy factor of 3%, annual appreciation rate of 5%, effective tax rate is 25%, and that's the estimated effective tax rate for federal and Colorado because we're going to use that to calculate depreciation, and the annual appreciation rate is used to calculate your appreciation. Property management is 10% a year, so 10% of rents. Monthly reserves, 
5%, and that's for repairs and maintenance. HOA is $299 a month. Your real estate taxes are $950 for the year. Your annual property insurance is about $300 a year. So to sum up the income and expenses, the annual rent income is $22,200, subtracting all your non-mortgage expenses. So vacancy and operating costs are about $8,500. That leaves you with a net operating income of $13,700. Subtract out your mortgage payments of about $8,900. And then your annual cash flow before taxes is $4,822. Nice. So it's a cash flowing property. So before we use the return on investment quadrant, look at all four ways, I want to go through and touch on three common metrics that people use to calculate rental property returns. So this way you have some a baseline to compare some common metrics we use to the overall return on investment that you can expect. So keep in mind that this is first year returns on the property uh, that we're talking about here. So your cash on cash return is 8.2%. Your cap rate is 7%. And your gross rent multiplier or GRM is 103. So if you don't know what those are, don't worry about that. Those are, I want to share those with people that are familiar with those. So they have a baseline for comparison. All right. So now let's look at the return on investment quadrant results. So I've taught this class a few times. And if you guys have been there, you'll know I'm about to ask, what do you expect your overall return on investment is? And take a second and think about yourself. If you put down $52,000 and change on this property, what percent return do you expect to make on your money in the first year? And unfortunately, I don't have Jeopardy music to play in the background. Um, all right, so what's your guess? Well, when I ask this question to people in real life and ask this question in classes, I usually get anywhere from 4 to 15%. What well, if I told you the projected return on this property was 33.2%. Yep, you heard me right, 33.2%. So what that 33.2% is, that's taking the percent return from each quadrant and combining it. So the cash flow, you're getting a return of 8.2%, which is actually the same return on cash on cash. Appreciation, you're getting an 18.1% return. From your debt pay down, you're getting a 4.1% return. And your depreciation tax benefits, you're getting a 2.8% return. Add all four of those together, and you're getting a 33.2% return. So just to clarify, because I've gotten this question a few times now, when I say you're getting an 18.1% appreciation return, that doesn't mean the property appreciated 18%. That means we got a return from appreciation on that $52,000 we put down. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. I just know that question is probably going through a few people's minds that are listening or watching this course right now. So I gave you a percent return. So now let's look at the total dollar return to give you a different perspective because this is how we calculate the percent return. So your cash flow, your cash flow return is $4,309. Your appreciation is $9,500. Your debt pay down is $2,150. That's the amount of equity that you or your tenants purchased back in the property that year. And your depreciation, assuming a 25% tax bracket, is just under $1,500. So how do we calculate these returns? And you might be getting a little hazy on here. So I'll do my best to describe this, but the I want you to think back to like third grade or fifth grade math. I think that's when you start learning fractions, at least the, the basics of it. This math will probably be a little bit more advanced than third grade math, but it's, it's all it is is simple fraction math. So if you can envision all four of those quadrants, appreciation, cash flow, debt pay down, depreciation, what we're doing here is we're saying, how much money are we making or how much money are we projecting to make from appreciation? And then we divide it by the total initial investment. So the amount of money you get in return is the numerator. And then the, the denominator in the fraction is your total initial investment. So for appreciation, we made $9,500 or we expect to make $9,500. So the way we calculated that was we purchased a place for $190,000 and I put in the spreadsheet a 5% appreciation rate. 5% times 190 comes out to be $199,500. So therefore, I'm making a 9,500 return appreciation. So 9,500 divided by 52,400 
gives me an 18.1% return. Going to cash flow, I'm making $4,309 in cash flow divided by 52,400 gives me an 8.2% return. Now going down to the debt pay down, you're getting $2,150 back in equity this year divided by 52,000 and change gives you a 4.1% return. And if you're realizing an almost $1,500 a year in tax benefit, $1,500 divided by 52,000 and change gives you 2.8%. So you add up all those together, you get 33.2%. So I'm going to kind of slow down here for a second because oftentimes people get sticker shock when they hear these numbers because they just don't believe it. They want to argue with me. And I'm not saying, hey, look, I'm right. You're wrong. I'm just saying here is another way to go out there and get rental properties. And I think it's a better way to look at rental properties because oftentimes people say, well, if I have a set a property with a 7% cap rate, that's going to be less than the stock market market making 8%. No, not really, because that's a cap rate is assuming you purchase a property all for cash. And it's not really factoring other benefits you're getting other than cash flow. Cash on cash return, same thing. That's looking at, great, I got an 8.2% cash on cash return. Or if I'm getting a 3.2% cash on cash return, whatever the cash on cash return is, you're only looking at one way you make money in real estate. Is that fair to compare one way you make money in real estate to a seven, you know, what is a seven to eight percent historical return in the stock market? I don't think so, because that seven to eight percent historical return in the stock market is usually accounting for two things: growth, so the the stock price is going up or appreciating, and any any dividends you get paid. So there's actually two types of returns you make in the stock market. Now, if you're looking at real estate, should you just look at the one type of return you're making in real estate? I don't think you should. If you think differently, that's your call. But I always want to look at this as how's it, how can I best deploy my capital? And, you know, frankly, if I thought I could make more money by buying stocks, I'd become a day trader or I'd become a guy working on Wall Street. I just don't think I can make more money. I think real estate can make a lot more money with by putting active time in there. And I know this for a fact, at least for myself, because I spent almost three years day trading and I got squat in returns. So with real estate, if you look at all four ways to make money, great. Here's a great way to look at your initial return on investment. So to highlight a few points here, keep in mind that this is an estimated return in your first year. We're saying you buy the property today, and then we're projecting these these returns over 12 months from now. Now, 12 months later, it's going to be exactly 33.2%. I doubt it, but you'll get a ballpark. So this is the one-year return on metric. And that's usually the way we look at things when we're buying rental property. Say, hey, what's that first year return you get when you invest money? So the cash flow return of this quadrant is the same as the calculation of using a cash on cash return that many people are familiar with. But here is one of the most interesting things from looking at these four ways to make money in real estate. And that's looking at the bottom half of the quadrant, which is the debt pay down and the depreciation you get, which is those almost guaranteed returns you get in real estate. You're going to have 4.1% from debt pay down and then 2.8% from depreciation. That's a 6.9% return. That's a 6.9% almost guaranteed return. What other investment class can you get an almost 7% guaranteed return? You certainly don't get it on a stock market. Some years get better, some years get worse, and you got the roller coaster while you go with that. So that's a 6.9% damn near guaranteed return plus you get appreciation and cash flow, which are things that always people measure. But if you're overlooking a 6.9% pretty much guaranteed return, does that change anything for you? Does that change your perspective? It did mine when I started realizing this because it made me even a lot more excited about real estate investing. Now, the thing is here, you're not getting a 6.9% cash back, you know, in your bank account that year. Some of that you're getting back on taxes. Some of that you're getting back on equity. Okay, so... I heard you guys through the recording. Actually, I get this question all the time. Um, So I went through this example. I second 5% appreciation. And someone always says, but Chris, I don't agree with your 5% appreciation. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to. Um, Let's plug in 3% to see what it does on the same property. So I'm taking those exact same numbers and I plugged in 3%. So my overall return goes to 25.9%. So it went from like 33% down to about 26%. Oh, wow. Do you need my shoulder to like 
you know, cry on for a 26% return? Probably not. But what that does is other three quadrants have stayed the same, but appreciation went down to 10.8%. I think we're at like 18.1. So appreciation went down because the property did not appreciate as much. Now, can we know how much the property appreciate this next year? No, we have no idea. Even if you think it's going to appreciate 0%, great, we'll subtract out 10.8%. The other three quadrants are still going to give you about a 15% return, which is still pretty damn good in my book. I mean, I still know nowhere else where I can get a, a pretty consistent 15% return. Some years of stock market I do. This past year I haven't. So if you don't like any of my assumptions, great. Download the spreadsheet. And the next episode will be all the details on how to do it and plug in your own assumptions and do what's right for you. I'm not telling you, you have to use these assumptions. I'm telling you a different way to analyze properties. I'm trying to give you the best data I can because this is what I use to model my own investments. All right. So I got one more example property I want to go through with you and we'll wrap up this, uh, this module. So the next example is a nomad property that we purchased in 2019 in Arvada. So a nomad property uh, is a property where the owner buys a property as their primary residence. They go live there for a year. Then after one year, they move out and they convert it to a rental property. So it's a very powerful and simple way to acquire rental properties for two main reasons. One is you get a very low down payment. You have a very low down payment because if you're getting a 30 year conventional loan through Freddie or Fannie, which is what most primary residences do, what type of down payment options do you get? Well, 3.5% for FHA or 5% down conventional. Now there's a bunch of other loan programs out there you can do lower, but generally we just model a 3.5 or a 5% down payment. So that's a lot less than the 20 to 25% down payment that you need as a landlord. So looking at $400,000 property, if I have a, a, a no matter buying the property at 5% down conventional, 5% of $400,000 is 20 grand or 5% uh, or 20% or 25% of $400,000 is 100 grand. Well, can you save 20 grand quicker or 100 grand quicker? Well, 20 grand. I mean, they're both a lot of money, but 100 grand is just a lot, lot more money than 20 grand. So you get a much lower down payment and you get a lower interest rate. So a lot of times your interest rates anywhere from, you know, a half a point to one point lower on a primary residence. Okay. So for this example, uh, this is, like I said, in our, in Arvada, it's a five bedroom, three bathroom, detached single family home that we purchased for about $430,000. It was a couple with two kids and this is their second nomad property. So they actually did a 5% down conventional. We did a purchase price of $430,000. Then looking at their acquisition cost, loan cost, and initial repair cost, they're all in for about $5,000 on those three areas. So that means they had a down payment of $21,500 and about $5,000 in other costs between acquisition, loan cost, and initial repair cost. And the initial repair costs are actually zero because this was a, a rehab or flip property that we purchased. So they were all in for about $26,000. Their interest rate, 3.75%. So once they move out after that one year, they expect $2,500 a month in rental income. Now it might be a little bit lower or might be a little bit higher depending on what the market's doing, but looking at the current estimates, they're right between $24 to $2,600 a month and we split the difference at 25 for modeling purposes. So a lot of the same assumptions earlier, 3% vacancy, 5% annual appreciation, 25% effective tax rate, 10% for property management, 5% for your monthly re repairs reserves, and we did lower because it's a rehab property. So we should have lower fixed up costs for the first few years. Our annual real estate taxes are about $1,650. Property insurance is just under $1,500. And we're estimating the water and sewer to be $1,500 a year. So your annual rent income is $30,000 minus your operating expenses of $10,000 leaves you with a net operating income of $20,000. Less your mortgage payments, including uh, mortgage insurance gives you it's about twenty five thousand dollars a year in mortgage payments. So twenty thousand minus twenty five thousand is negative cash flow. So it's an annual cash flow before taxes of a negative four thousand eight hundred twenty two dollars. Uh oh, it's a negative cash flowing property. Does that mean it's an automatic pass? No. This is why you got to learn the four ways to look at money, plus other ways to go out there and look at acquiring property. 
If you want all the reasons to why we actually do buy properties with a small native cash flow like this from a house hacking or nomad perspective, make sure you check out the future course or come to a class on nomad and house hacking because we go through all those numbers on there. But from a very high level, take a step back and think about, well, would I rather buy a property now by putting $25,000 down total or about $110,000 down total plus I need a place to live for a year or two? When we look at those other factors, it makes a lot of sense to buy these properties even if you have a slight negative cash flow. So looking at the first year returns with traditional investing metrics, your cash on cash return is a negative 17.1%. So we do buy a lot of nomad and house hack properties that do have a positive cash flow once they move out. I specifically picked a negative cash flowing property for an example here on the return on investment quadrant because I want to show you why cash flows on everything and how it can actually, how it impacts your overall returns. So again, a negative 17% cash on cash return, cap rates of 4.7, and it's a GRM of 172. Okay, so if we look at those numbers, that's nothing exciting from a you know, pure rental process. If you're, if you're, cause if you're looking to put 25% down and buy rental properties, we would not be buying this property. But from a nomad or house tax standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. So plugging this into the return on investment quadrant to get the four ways we make money in real estate, do you think this will have a higher or lower overall return, overall percentage return than the Aurora condo rental example? I'll give you a second to think about that. Plus, I need to drink some water while I record this. So are we going to get a higher or lower return than the Aurora rental property? So I know a lot of people, they guess lower. So I plugged all this in here and I'm looking at it right now. It's a 107% overall return. Yep, 107 All right, I'll read this through to you. Cash flow, negative 17%. Appreciation, 83%. Debt pay down, 29%. Depreciation, 13%. Wow, those are big numbers. And yeah, you're going to say a large percent comes from appreciation. You're right. We'll talk more about that in a second. But let's look at the overall return, or actually not the overall return, but the, the actual dollar figures that you're getting from those different four ways you make money. Because... The reason we're seeing a higher overall return on this property is for two reasons. One is the power of leverage. Go back to the uh, fraction problem I gave you a few minutes ago. Well, we have a much smaller denominator. So we have a smaller denominator that gives us a greater number on the back once we calculate it. Plus, this is a more expensive property. We're buying a $430,000 property versus a $190,000 property. So when you look at the debt pay down benefit or the uh, the tax benefits or anything like that, we will get a higher return because there's a it's a more expensive property. So if we get a 5% appreciation across any asset, the more expensive an asset, the greater return you'll get because 5% of $430,000 is 21500 So what we're going to do is I'll go through each one of those quadrants right now and say, and take that 5% appreciation in one year, and we'll say 21500 divided by your total initial investment of $26,000 gives you that 82.7%. Negative $4,500 a year in cash flow divided by $26,000 gives you a negative 17%. Your debt pay down, $2,150 divided by $26,000 gives you 28.9%. And your tax benefits of $3,323 divided by $26,000 gives you 12.8%. So the reason I share this with you is for two reasons. One is I wanted to make sure you looked at the overall way to look at the returns on investment and also just to really emphasize the power of leverage. Because really, the lower you put down, the more it's going to amplify your return. Now, it works both ways. If the market's going good, great, that's good for appreciation and cash flow. But if the market tanks like it did 12 years ago, well, we're going to have an amplified negative return as well. But regardless of what the market does, we're seeing some really great returns on the depreciation and debt pay down because we have a much smaller overall cash invested. And those are really based off the uh, value of the property, not the other metrics with lending and things like that in there. Now, I do have to give a little side note in here because the I'm using the first year returns and, you know, technically the first year when we're looking at the person lives in here, 
So they're not able to get depreciation benefits, not getting rental income. This is really once they move out after the first year and convert to a rental property. So in reality, the numbers will be slightly different because this is going to be like year two and beyond. But it's going to be pretty darn close. And trying to get year two with all that just really complicates things. So overall, you'll get the gist of the punchline here, which is that you need to understand the four ways you make money in real estate. And that leverage is a powerful, powerful tool. Again, if you're scratching your head on these returns on Nomad and House Hack properties, make sure you come to one of our classes or make sure you check out the future course I'll be putting together on this. Or of course, you can always reach out to me if you got any questions. All right. So that wraps up the content for this class. So to conclude it, you know, my whole goal here was to just hopefully open your eyes to a different way of analyzing rental properties. And so you can compare it to other investment classes because I see so many people get hyper-focused on cash flow, which is important. I see so many people get hyper-focused on cash flow, they never move forward with buying real estate. And I personally think if you're just focused on cash flow, you're missing the boat because there are three other ways to make money in real estate. And I think it's silly to not account for those three ways. Now, I'm not saying go out there and buy negative cash flowing properties as your main metric, but don't just get hyper-focused on cash flow. And please, please don't say, oh, well, I'm getting a 5% return on cash on cash in here. Well, I can be in that stock market at 7%. That's not apples to apples comparison. Take the money you're investing in year one and project out the returns you'll get. That's what I do. And that's how I deploy my own capital and go out there and buy. And I still buy the stock market every year. I still buy bonds every year. But the vast majority of my capital goes towards real estate uh, because I get better returns like this. And I still buy the stock market and bonds because I want diversification and I want to keep growing my liquidity because real estate's not nearly as liquid as bonds and stocks are. Okay, so the next episode on here, the next course module will actually go through using the spreadsheet. So make sure you check that out and actually download a copy of the spreadsheet so you can use it yourself. It's a free download. It's a free course. Use it. And that way you can plug in whatever numbers you want to for your own assumptions and your own property variables. And then the couple of modules after that one goes into return on equity. So if you think back to that cash flow or the return on investment quadrant, we got the left side, which is the cash later side. That's your debt pay down and your appreciation side. That builds the equity. And so after a couple of years, looking at the initial money you invested is not the best way to go forward at seeing what return on your equity. So this is where we have to shift gears as you start owning the property for a couple of years, shift gears from what you put in from day one. Now you're in day 300 or day whatever, day like 1500, so year four or five, whatever that math is, I think year five. Well, now we need to look at not just your investment, but how do we optimize that return equity because your real estate piggy bank is growing and that's there is opportunity cost for that money sitting there. So those modules go through understanding what you can do with that money and give you different ways to utilize it, whether you keep it in there or you redeploy it to go buy more rental properties. All right. So thank you for watching, listening. If you got any questions on here, reach out to me. I love talking about this stuff. If you found anything confusing, definitely reach out to me. I want to clarify it. Uh, please leave comments on the blog post. That way, if you have a question, uh, I'll definitely answer, but other people can have that same question answered as well. And if you have any questions, of course, reach out to me. If you need help putting together a game plan for real estate or buying a real estate uh, rental properties, reach out to me as well. That's, you know, that's what I do. All right, guys. Thank you and have a great day.